like Pete Townsend from The Who gave me a piano for my fifth birthday, right? Jesus. Which is fucking amazing, <laughs> right? Hello, everybody, and welcome to Drinks with Johnny on this very special Father's Day edition of the show. I am joined by Glenn and Charlie Johns. Now, Charlie Johns is the PR person that I've met, has brought on uh, people like Shavo Dejian to the show. Uh, she works for Costa Nostra. Uh, again, she does great uh, PR work. And her father is, of course, the legendary engineer and producer, Glenn Johns. He was on pretty much every record from the 60s and 70s that was worth anything. I mean, he did everything from the uh, Eagles' first few records, the first Zeppelin record. He was uh, famously on the Get Back record that would later be called Let It Be. Um, you could watch, all, he's part of the documentary that Peter Jackson just did. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about so many of the great things that Glenn has done. He's got a book out, The Sound Man. He's got, uh, I mean, just so much things. He's, he's been in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame a few times now. He's visited there once to be inducted a couple other times for speeches. I can't wait to uh, pick his brain and, of course, talk to Charlie about what it was like growing up and looking up to this man that so, uh, has meant so much to the music industry, the profession that I'm in. So it uh, looks like they're ready to go. So uh, let's bring it on and start the show. Hey, guys, how are you doing today? You ready for round two? Yeah. Yes, hopefully the connection will hold up and we don't have to change it again. Yeah, so far so good. Um, how are you guys good. doing? Did you guys have a good weekend, a good week? What, what's new? Uh, yeah. Flew back home. Got jet lag. Uh, <laughs> nothing much to report, really. Still trying to wake up. <clears throat> we didn't, I, Dennis, neither my wife or I slept very much while we were away. And we were gone for seven days, I guess it was. So we, we got a bit of catching up to do somewhere along the line. Yeah, well, let's see how we go on. Yeah. Um, a lot of, the weather's spectacular, been out in the garden doing things. Yeah, good, everything's cool. Oh, I love that. And Chuck's been moving back into her, well, moving in. <laughs> to a new place. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Charlie, um, I just yes. learned that I just learned that Glenn calls you Chuck, so um, I, th yeah. I think we're gonna have to call you Chuck for the rest of the episode. Yeah, my, I, like my like my closest friends in my family call me Chuck. <laughs> well, I'll wait till you give me the okay. Maybe after this episode, of I course, I, I, I'm happy with it. I, 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 I like it. I have a Chuck, I have a Chuck Taylor tattoo. Where I'm up. Chuck Taylor tattoo on this oh, arm nice. because all my friends call me Chuck. So that's it's fine. That's perfect. So, you know, uh, from our chats, I'm a huge wrestling fan, professional wrestling fan. Glenn, yep, same. did you ever get into pre professional wrestling or is this all foreign to you? <laughs> no. Sorry. The no <laughs> well, the no no. Just the notion. Not my of task to tell you at all. No. <laughs> no. Okay. Load of nonsense. Absolute load of nonsense. Yeah, so I mean, so obviously, uh, Charlie, you didn't get that uh, from growing up and, and having it on the on the TV growing up, right? No, I was. I remember getting like a WWE magazine at the grocery store when I was with my mum. I must have been about nine, and it had Jake the Snake Roberts on it and The Undertaker. And I remember being quite terrified. Yes. I remember being quite terrified by the notion of someone having live snakes, it, like it, to do with anything, and um, and the Undertaker just looked really scary, and that was kind of my intrigue point. And then when I got to where I went to university, it was right during the Attitude Era, so um, and like the, the, some of the people I lived with were super into it, so I got super into it then, like was obsessed with the Hardy Boys and Lisa and all of that good stuff. Um, I'm and loving then Glenn just shake his head over here, just going. What? He has no idea what. He has no idea. <laughs> it's what not I'm too late, about. Glenn. It's not too late. They have, <laughs> they okay. have the, the the network where you could go back and find all these wonderful things that Charlie's talking about. It's it's fantastic. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yes, and then um, yeah, when, and then when Terry and I got together, we discovered that we both really love wrestling, and we um, went to our first WrestleMania together in. 2012 in Miami, which was amazing, and then we tried we tried to make it a yearly thing after that, and then once we moved here, obviously tried to go to as much as possible. And then AEW started, and like that was it. Like, but I was straight back in. I kind of lost I kind of lost interest in WWE a little bit, and then when AEW started, I was like, yes, this is for me. And I and I think I think what they're doing is incredible. I I couldn't agree more. I love I love that there's another company doing something a little different. It's great to be a wrestling yep. fan right now. WrestleMania came back great. like a full flex this year, which was 
amazing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we could, we, I'm sure we could just do an episode, you and me, Charlie, about, about wrestling, yeah. but I feel like Ben's going to be over here going, what the fuck, am, what, why am I even here? Yes. Why am I even here? What the fuck is going on? You got it in one. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. Sorry. So it's seven o'clock uh, your time. All right. Hey. It's seven o'clock your time. I saw you uh, have a drink in hand. What are you? What yeah. are you drinking on tonight? I'm drinking whiskey and water. Whiskey and water. What? What is that? Any particular bl- brand of whiskey you got there, or? or- um, I, I can't remember which one this is. I've got several. I just grabbed a bottle. Um, it's Scotch whiskey. Um, Scotch, okay. That's that's all you need to know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, is it? Well, no, I need to know more. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an efficient of, of drinking. I don't know if you could see my bar oh, back here. Yeah, but. No, okay, fair enough. I can't. <laughs> no, is it? it but it's Glenfiddich. It's Glenfiddich. Glenfiddich. Okay, so it's a Highland. Yeah. Okay, awesome. I love that. Fifteen year old Glenfiddich. Oh, I love that scotch. Yeah. I got a, yeah. I got a Stone IPA right now because yeah. I saw that I saw before we started this episode you had a drink, and it's a rule for me. Doesn't matter how early it is my time, if a guest is drinking, I will drink as well. So cheers. Oh, that's very, very polite. Yes, cheers. Good on you. Yeah. <laughs> cheers. I have water. I will not be drinking because I have a full day of work ahead of me after this. So I can't oh, be why do you be, be bring the party pooper into the into the? I'm sorry. Now. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can pretend to be drunk if you like. <laughs> no, that's fine. We don't need that. We just want to have a good time. Um, as we said, Absolutely. as we were talking, uh, a lot of people don't realize that this is now the second time we've had a chat because the first time while you guys were in New York together. <laughs> the internet was awful and we couldn't get through it. I just had to, I had to call it. I, I appreciate you guys taking the time to come back now that you're se- uh, had time to separate and now you're back in London, you're, you're back in LA. How was that week? I know you guys didn't get a chance to, haven't seen each other before that in like two years plus. Um, how was it now looking back? You guys are back at home. How was that week for you? Oh, it was, it was amazing. Um, Obviously, firstly, just to see each other after such a long time after the pandemic. And then um, dad turned 80 in February and I was supposed to go back for it. But, um, but so there's a very convoluted and very boring reason why I couldn't to do with basically if you renew your visa and you leave America, you have to go to your embassy and get your visa put in your passport. And the UK embassy currently is on a three month backlog. So if I had left and gone to, to dad's birthday in the UK, I wouldn't have been able to come back for three months. So I had to skip that. So being able to see dad and Glenis like quite shortly afterwards was, was fucking wonderful because I was obviously very sad. Um, and yeah, you know, getting to do all the Hall of Fame stuff with him and like tag along for that was really fun. Um, and then just, you know, hanging out in New York, which is a city that I love because it kind of reminds me of London a lot, um, was, really, was, was great. It was really nice. We stayed, we stayed in Soho, which obviously is a really nice part of town, and we went for lots of nice food and just chilled out, and yeah, it was great. It was really great. I, I second all of that. It, we we FaceTime each other very regularly, at mm. least once a week, if not more. And it yeah. is brilliant, but, it's, but there's nothing quite like being in the same room uh, and, yeah. and the other cool thing was we had lots to do it wasn't just a, us getting together we were doing lots of things together as well so it worked out really well and I've still got a large grin on my face from the whole hey. it was uh, brilliant, I love that I love that I'm yeah. glad that you guys got that time and you said uh, you turned 80 in February what, uh, what, what day is your birthday? Uh, the 15th Oh, okay, the 15th, so day after Valentine's. My son is February 7th. Our ex-drummer is February 9th. My father's February 9th. My cousin's February 9th. I got a lot of February. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. That is crazy. Yeah, I yeah, love it. Uh, something weird going on there. Yeah. Bunch yeah. of Aquarius. Surrounded by Aquarius. Uh, surround, yeah. I'm surrounded by Aquarius, and, I, and I'm a Scorpio. I don't know how it works, but we get along just fine. Oh. Yeah, well, there okay. you go. And I also, don't, I also don't know if that's like a – I don't follow – those signs and stuff. I don't really know what each really means. <laughs> I just know that I'm a Scorpio and my son's an Aquarius. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Absolute load of nonsense, really. But listen, if people want to believe it, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Why not? Why not? Why not? When, when's your birthday, Charlie? January 1st. I'm a Capricorn. Oh, wow. January 1st. So you have like a headache all the time on your birthday now, right? I never go out on New Year's ever, like, because I just always find that it's such an anticlimax and it brings out all the people that don't usually drink and, like, who are, like, right, you know, in, for, in forced fun. 
And like, we've got to have fun because it's New Year's Eve and then they inevitably end up getting absolutely shit faced and not being able to handle themselves. And it's always just a nightmare. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a cool birthday until it'll, you kind of realize that like no one ever wants to do anything for it because they're either skint or hungover or on a diet or, you know, dry for January or whatever. So I haven't really done anything really for my birthday for like 15 years. I just turned 40 and I didn't do anything for that either. So well, happy birthday to I'm you both. Birthday. I know it's okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Those are, those are some big ones, you know, like, uh, <laughs> I, I think that's great. Um, you mentioned being at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, for the, is it the Get Back uh, exhibit that uh, you guys were out for? The, yeah, you started that and, exactly right. And yeah. you guys said that, the, um, that they treated you guys really nicely. You guys had a good time. How was the speech? How was, how was everything? Tell me a little bit more about the, the exhibit and what your, your they, part was. They, they looked after us like royalty. They were completely lovely. Um, Including Charlie, and they, you know, and I invited Charlie along. They, they didn't, and and I think they were really glad she was there. It was really cool. The the exhibit is quite remarkable. I, I have to say, it's a re- they've done a brilliant job. Yeah, um, it's really cool. Very cool indeed. It, it's not that easy to to show an ex- to have an, a, a museum exhibit of a film. Yeah, mm. they've done it. They pulled it off. It's really cool. Does it look Very. like the Does it look like the studio you guys were in uh, during the get back sessions? No, no, that, that that no, it doesn't. No, there are little there are little compartments, little rooms that you go okay. into, and, and it plays little bits of the film. When you walk in, there's supposed to be some dialogue between me and the band, I, which I never heard because everything else was too loud. But <laughs> which is probably <laughs> a good thing. Uh, but no, it's, it, no, it's it's it. They, I thought they were going to do it like the studio, but it, it isn't like that at all. It's, but it's very cool. Awesome. I can't wait to check it out. I have still not been to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I've been through Cleveland a million times. I've never even gone as, as a paying customer just to go through. I don't know what's wrong with me. I should have probably 10 times over at this point. But it's now Now I have to go out and, and, and yeah. check it all out. Yeah, yeah, you should. You should. It's really cool. There's a really cool CBGB's uh, like section of the exhibit, uh, like um, the exhibit that they've got at the moment. That's got a whole bunch of punk stuff that I think you probably love. Ooh, so I would it's worth doing. Absolutely living. love that. I would absolutely love mm. that. Um, how many have you been before this time, Charlie? No, my first time. I, I, I wanted to go when Dad got inducted in 2012, but I still lived in the UK at that point, and it didn't work out timing-wise with my work and my job and everything. So um, I didn't get to I didn't get to see that in person, which was a bit of a shame. But it was very cool this time around. Like they took us up to like the inductees hall, where they have all the signatures of all the inductees in like on these little plaques, and Dad got to watch back like watch his induction part of the ceremony back on like a little screen. It was oh. that was pretty cool to see. Um, And then they have this like kind of little theater, like cinema theater thing where they have like a 12 minute film. that's like the performances over the years all cut together in like one big long film. That, that was really fucking cool. Seeing like Prince jamming with like Bruce Springsteen and like a whole bunch of other people, like from, I don't know what year it was, but it was fucking incredible. Um, And like Aretha Franklin was like someone else random, but amazing. Like it was really cool. Well, I mean, you just named a lot of really great things that I would love to check out. You mentioned you guys were treated like royalty. I mean, your father is rock and roll royalty. Like, we, of course, you guys were treated like royalty. I mean, yeah. from all the work you've done, Glenn, um, over the years, I mean, it, we could get into, I'm, I'm sure we're going to get into so much. Our last conversation, we didn't get into the music too much. We were just, just starting to break the ice when we had to call it quits, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I've since then, I've, I've, I'm like halfway through your book, The Sound Man, which is an incredible uh, listen for me. I did Audible. I can't read. All right. I'm just going to admit it right now. I, hey. I, I, I can read. Don't get me wrong. But I have to I, I absorb information so much better by listening. It's just how it's just how I how I okay. understand things better. Great book. You've done so many great things. And I know it's probably talked about over and over. I didn't realize that you drink, to be honest. Because you said you don't do drugs and you've never touched them uh, in your book, uh, and I was like, "Well, does that mean he's never even had a drink?" And then I saw the the, mm. the Get Back documentary, and I was like, "I'm pretty sure that's a drink in his hand there." <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I very you can't if, if you're particularly if you're engineering, which I invariably am. Um, you can't be out of it on anything. You can't right. be 
you've got to be completely in the present. You've got to know what time it is, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because everyone else isn't, isn't paying attention. Because everyone else hasn't got a clue, and nor do they care. <laughs> uh, so um, I, didn't, I, I hardly drank at all for years and years and years. I, mean, I did not drink, but mm-hmm. I, it, it wasn't a daily thing. Now I, I like a glass of wine with my food. That's about it, really. Uh, that's great, though. I mean, who doesn't like a glass of wine with their food? Exactly. Right yeah. I, mean, I mean, now and now you're you're. Have you, are you still actively engineering anything? Or when's the last, yeah, when's just, the last time you got in the yeah, studio? I, I'm, yeah, I'm still. I'm going completely deaf yet. Um, <laughs> but, well, not enough for anyone to notice anyway. I'm sure they'll find me out soon. Enough. Um, <laughs> the last thing I did was a, a compilation album of Christine McVie's solo work. So basically, I was given access to her catalogue of solo work. And um, I took that and overdubbed Ethan, my son, uh, playing guitar and drums on a bunch of it. Um, just changed the arrangement slightly um, and got a couple of different keyboard players, Guy Fletcher from Dire Straits. Okay. And Ricky Peterson uh, to overdub a couple of keyboards. And... Um, it's worked out. It worked out really well. And I, mi- I mixed that. Yeah. Um, and I'm about, I'm about to start something else, I think, in, in a short while, which I'm not allowed to talk about yet. But, uh, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if it, uh, just so you know, I mean, I'm not releasing this until Father's Day, which is uh, the middle of June. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, it, it, this particular project is being discussed. Okay, I love that. Uh, I love in the that. last couple of days, and I, I have no idea whether it'll actually come off or not. But uh, how have you? Does, so, how have you adjusted your engineering mixing? over the years with the new technologies and new, I mean, Pro Tools, all these things. I know you famously said you don't like to record to Pro Tools or digital. You like to record to tape. Are you recording to tape and then moving it into Pro Tools now? Um, what no, you, why? There's no need. There wouldn't be any need to do that. No, right. I'm, I'd mix straight off, off analog. Um, obviously, if I have to use Pro Tools, I will. But um, And in the case of the Christian McVie thing I did, okay. just did, a lot of it came to me on Pro Tools. So, I mean, I didn't have any choice. Um, but if I'm making an album from scratch, I'll still record analog and probably 16 track, not even 24. Wow. And then mix to 15 IPS quarter inch. Um, don't use a computer. Don't need, don't, I don't like mixing things in bits. To me, it's a, if you've, if you've got 24 faders, if it's 24 track, that's, yeah, I can handle it. I don't need to have a computer memorize anything. I do it all live. Wow. That's incredible. You still, I mean, that's, I mean, I guess you got the, you, you got the status to be able to walk into a studio and get uh, all analog, but it's, it's hard to find analog studios these days. Well, yeah, I know. I don't need too many, so it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, no, you- I love it. I mean, I absolutely love it. And the idea of, of converting to using a computer in the way most people do doesn't appeal to me in the least. It's, it's, um, I love uh, some of the better mixes I've ever done. For example, I made a mistake and it was marvelous, you know, and it worked out being better than what I thought. So I like having that on the edge bit of mixing rather than it all being programmed. Ah, that's, that's awesome. I mean, I would love to see that. Uh, I mean, since I started, uh, music 20 years ago, it's all been Pro Tools and digital stuff. We've done some stuff to tape. We've done drums to tape um, in the past, but slowly just moved everything over to Pro Tools and everything gets programmed in the mix. And we've gone out with Andy Wallace. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work um, as a mixing yeah. engineer, um, but he's done all of our records. And he has the faders all programmed. And look, it, it was impressive. It's very impressive to see them all just like, you're just watching them go up and down all yeah. programmed. <laughs> I'm afraid. I'm afraid there's too much watching going on. In, in yeah, not, not enough listening, right? Technique. Not enough listening. People <laughs> look at a screen all the time and they're judging what they're hearing right. by their eyes, and it's got nothing to do with anything. I, I'm sure I, I, I'm not familiar with your band, but I bet they're bloody marvelous. And mm. and if it's a if it's a straightforward rock and roll band, which I believe it is, 
I don't know how straightforward it is. It's not very straightforward, but I no, appreciate no, it. No, no. <laughs> okay. We have layer many layers. There's a reason we, okay. we, we, yeah. we're, in the, we're in the digital but, but, era of layering things over and over. I, we've done a couple of times where we strip it all down uh, on records, but for the most part, we have like three or four different lead guitar tracks plus four rhythm guitar tracks, three bass tracks, drums everywhere. Like we're we're... We're pretty eclectic. We have strings, uh, full orchestras that come in. I mean, you sh give it a listen and, and uh, let, let, let Chuck know what you think uh, after Okay, that. so when you go and play live, yeah, how do you deal with that if you've got full bass parts or... Oh, well, I mean, live, we, you know, you just have, it's, well, it's, it's a direct, it's a direct line in, it's a mic uh, clean amp and a mic dirty amp for my bass. So, uh, so those are the three things. What we do is we blend out the two um, clean and dirty. We don't have a DI on it and put those out into, into the speakers for backing tracks, like strings and everything. Uh, we, we play to pro tools. Actually, there's a, there's a pro tools click in the back oh, I see. and those, I see. those are programmed and will pop up, but all the okay. instruments like guitars, bass, drums, vocals, all those are, are the five of us doing those. And we just find arrangements that work. The more important parts are the ones that we'll play. And some of the other ones get on the wayside. Okay, it's it's a okay. it's it's a it's a hoot. It's a little different than uh, what you used to deal with, but it, it's 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 a lot yeah, of fun. Sounds a lot different. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, how it's was it? It's very good, up? though. Oh, thank you, Charlie. How how was it growing up in this? So this last record, your your brother was obviously on Ethan. Uh, your dad's mm. a, a great musician and and engineer. I've heard some of your singles uh, as well that were number one uh, on the charts before there, Glenn. How was? Did you? play any instruments early on or are you still picking around on anything no i mean i, I learned i learned piano when i was very young um and i wasn't great at it um and i think i i, I got give, my my godfather is a chap called fred wallachy who own who used to own the oldest musical instrument store in hollywood um for a very very in long westwood, time yeah. in fact, not in, uh, westwood okay sorry i thought it was just in general um but um, he gave me, when I was very little, like an antique violin. And so I had lessons on that for a minute, but that, again, didn't really, uh, didn't strike. And I learned the flute for a while. Again, I mean, I, I, could, I really struggled to read music, so I would learn by ear. And obviously, like, when you're learning less, like, when you're having lessons with teachers, that's not what they want. They want you to be able to read the music, so I would right. just lose interest in it very quickly. <laughs> um, Dad tried to teach me to play guitar a few times when I was a teenager because I got into my phase of like, I will be a rock star. Um, <laughs> and it would get to like try to do bar chords and I just couldn't make my hands do the shapes. So again, I was like, fuck this, this is rubbish. Um, how, many so how many lessons did you get from your father? I want to know, like, I, I, take me into those lessons. We, I want to know what was going tried, on there. We tried a couple of times and what he would do is he would sit me down, he would show me and then he would like write out the tabs or whatever, or like, you know, the strings and where you put your fingers on it. And I would go away and try it and I'd be fine with like, you know, A and C or whatever. And then as soon as you had to do the bar chord thing, I was just, like, I, for some reason, my hands just couldn't do it. And I was like, right, no, I'm very impatient. If I'm not good at something immediately, I'll usually be like, fuck this, it's rubbish. <laughs> why, don't want why, to don't do you, it anymore. why didn't you just go my route and go bass? I mean, after <laughs> you, you, you give up, you, you give up on the guitar and you start playing bass. That's that's the rule of thumb. One well, nose at a time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back, that, I probably could have handled that, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it became apparent quite quickly that like all of the musical talent went to my brother. And actually, because Ethan and Abigail are my half brother and half sister. They're from Dad's first marriage. I'm from his second. So they, but like my sister is like a was an incredible flautist. Like she she plays flute incredibly, and she also can play the saxophone very well. Oh, wow. um, and obviously Ethan is Ethan. I mean, Ethan is one of those sickeningly disgusting people that can pick up anything and play it within like two days. It's gross, but also incredible. <laughs> so I think Ethan inherited the majority of like the musical talent. Um, so you know that obviously is fantastic. And you know, growing up around they're constantly being music all the time was, was amazing. Uh, and the reason why I want, I wanted to work in music in some capacity, I just didn't know what, um, and eventually fell into PR, <laughs> which and I love. And how did, how did, how did you fall into PR? I was, I was very curious about that. Like, obviously you said you're around music and you knew you wanted to be a part of it in, at some capacity. Well, how did you first find that job? What was the first gig and who, who did you first represent? I, 
I really didn't find, like, it, I feel like it kind of found me rather than okay. the other way around. Um, I had done, like, throughout my 20s, I had done a spate of other jobs. I had done some work experience at record labels when I left university, but obviously when you do work experience, it's not, there's no guarantee of a job. And even though people were like, you're clearly very good and, you know, you're very motivated and you love music, you know, we don't have a job for you, which was fine. Um, and my mum... My mom had moved to Spain and dad and my stepmom were living in France at the time. So I literally had to pay the bills, obviously. So I couldn't live at home and keep trying to pursue that. So I ended up working. My first job was working in a real estate agent's office, which was fucking awful. I had to wear a trouser suit every day and high heels. And I hated every fucking second of it. I cannot picture Um, you in that outfit right now. (laughs) I know. It was bad. It was really bad. I hated it. I hated it so much. Um... And then I did, and then I worked it for an advertising agency for quite a while doing post production, like uh, producing post production suites, which was really fun and very really nice. And being in a creative environment was great, but there was no real progression. That's what I kind of left. Um, and then I was kind of between jobs and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And it just so happened that dad was in the studio with um, Scott Gorham from Thin Lizzy, uh, remixing and overdubbing some old live stuff. And dad was like, you know, come and hang out if you want, come say hi if you're not doing anything. So I did. And, you know, divine intervention, whatever you want to call it, Scott's wife, Christine, who's wonderful, um, had just started the in-house PR department at Live Nation in the UK. So Scott was like, you know, if you want to go and just talk to Christine and see if she knows anybody that's looking for anything, because, I, you know, I've been sat there saying to him, what, you know, all of this is well and good, but what I really want to do is work in music. And I, I'm, I'm a bit stuck as to how I even make that transition, like with the experience that I've got, et cetera, et cetera. Long, tr- trying to keep this really short. Um, so I, went, I, I go in to see her, Christine, and, and um, her colleague at the time, Steve Guest, who then became who later became my boss. Um, and they like they were like, well, if you want to do some work experience, you know, and meet some people and come work with us for a couple of weeks, it would you know whatever, and see how how it fits, whatever. You're welcome to. And at the time, I was a bit like, I'm 26. I've done my time work experience. I've been you know earning good money for the last five years. I'm not sure I want to do that. But then I thought about it and I was like, this is really what I want to do. And this is fucking Live Nation and I shouldn't really be snobby about it. I should give it a go and see what happens. They, my first day on the job, they sent me out in like, the streets of central London and Soho with a massive Gene Simmons cardboard cut out because they, were, they got announced as headliners for download that year. So I was like, I sent out to take pictures of him around Soho with a photographer, which was, I was, and I was just like, this is fucking incredible. This is literally my dream. This is what I want to be doing. Um, <laughs> And after about a month of me doing work experience there, they were getting me to do things that were very much not work experience level. So I had a conversation with them and they created a role for me. And then um, about, I think maybe three or four years later, I was running the PR department there. And I did that for a good eight years until I moved here. And then you start, and then you went to, to your own Costa Nostra stuff, right? Costa Nostra, yeah. yeah. Which is obviously, it originally was a, is a UK company. It's, it mm-hmm. was started by... Michelle and Kirsten, who were the in-house team at Roadrunner Records for many, many, many years. And then when Roadrunner folded into Warner's, they went independent and took all of their, like, Roadrunner clients, you know, Slipknot, Machine Head, Lamb of God, all of those guys, took them with them. And when I when Terry, when Terry and I moved out here, they approached me and were like, you know, we've been thinking about expanding into the US for a while. And obviously, I worked with them very, very closely in the UK, and they asked me if I would do it for them. And I was like, hell yeah, Absolutely. And that's what happened. Where, where here we are. <laughs> here we are, indeed. That's a, I, I, that's so interesting to me. How that would, as I, as I said, I I wouldn't even know where to start on any of that. Like it's it's just wild. But I have to go back to the beginning of your story there, where you were uh, wearing trouser suits. Um, and speaking of of early on outfits, uh, Glenn, do you have any more of those shag jack uh, jackets you were wearing in the Get Back uh, documentary? No, I don't. <laughs> Uh, I wish no. you did. I would. I would. Ro- I would rock those right now. Like those are amazing right? jackets. I don't even the leather, remember. the crocodile one. That, I, was, I would one totally that was that was cro- yeah. That that I gave to Ethan years and years ago, oh. and he, he doesn't have that anymore. No, all the others. I don't remember what I did with them. Set fire to them, probably. <laughs> I saw the light. <laughs> Well, you, like, Dad, Dad was telling me with the, with the goat coat, which is the white one, which is actually made of goat. Is um, it really? That's amazing. He, he, had, he had to stop wearing it because obviously in the UK, it's very damp and wet. And when dead goat gets wet, it obviously gets quite smelly. <laughs> so Unbelievably jacket, smelly. So the jackets, he had to throw it away because it didn't smell good anymore. Yeah, it's time for place out. Yeah. <laughs> it looked <laughs> fabulous though. So, you know. 
It did look fabulous. I was, yeah, I was watching that and I was like, oh, that's amazing. Like, I'm going to have this guy on my show here soon. This is amazing. I got to ask him about that jacket. <laughs> What's extraordinary is I used to dress like that every day. I mean, I wasn't dressed up because I was working with the Beatles. I right. That's how I dress, which is even more embarrassing Going up to you. <laughs> I don't think it's a great. I think it was a great icon, look. Mate. What can you say? Yeah, I think it was a great look. I mean, you talk. You talk about how uh, you just mentioned you were. That's kind of how you dress all the time. And in your book, you were talking about when you're traveling with the Stones, and everyone was like, "Oh, he's in the band too." And and you're like, "Well, you're taking pictures of the wrong guys. They're over here." You know. <laughs> I loved hearing those stories, and you know, like the 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 stash stories of. Uh, uh, what was it? Someone someone had to put a, a silver package down their pants, and it fell right in front of co- customs, and you were, you noticed it. Brian Jones, yeah, in Sweden. <laughs> I couldn't even imagine going through customs nowadays is terrible, but back then with drugs, like what would that must have been so nerve wracking. Well, not for me because I didn't. You, you were clean, but <laughs> I was clean, clean as anything. Yeah, yeah, pretty extraordinary. I mean. Particularly when you got off the plane and you walked into the customs hall, as we did on that occasion, um, the, the government in Sweden had decided to make an issue out of the stones and drugs. And so they, they allowed the media into the customs hall. So there was a bank of photographers and film cameras behind the customs area filming, supposedly everybody being busted, you know, which, which uh, of course didn't happen. But... But they, they went through everything with a fine tooth comb. But, but the story I tell in the, in the book, it, it's absolutely true. It, 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 he, he, put, he had put a stash in his underpants, and while his bags were being searched, he, it fell down his trouser leg onto the ground. And I was sitting 20 yards away with Stu, the keyboard player in the band, and we saw it, and we both <laughs> looked at each other. And the security guy, Tom Keylock, his name was, calmly walked over and picked it up. And we walked out down this corridor, I don't forget, and there were potted palms all the way down this corridor after leaving the customs area, and he just dropped it into, <laughs> into one of the potted palm pots. Unbelievable. <laughs> wow. Hysterical. Hysterical, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, wanted I thought to, Brian Jones was going to die. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, dude. Like that was yeah. a, and all those cameras, them filming and everything. No one else noticed that drop down his down his pants. You know. Well, like, no, because he was standing. They, they were, were behind, gotcha. filming him that way, and there was a countertop. <laughs> Sorry, so drop behind from his waist down. It was, right. It was it. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Now, now I'm now I'm picturing it a little bit better. Now I'm picturing it again. <laughs> I wanted to ask though, like I've I've heard like a lot of I know it's like a memoir, uh, a biography is your book, um, and I've heard a lot of people. I've I've never written my own book or anything like that. I hear I hear a lot of celebrities will have someone else write it, and they're just asking the questions or kind of interviewing you. Like some guys, like uh, Charlie would know, like the guys in No Effects, they didn't actually put pen to paper. There was a guy interviewing them. The guys in Bad Religion when they released their book, uh, was that your? Did you actually put pen to paper for this book, The Sound Man? Oh yeah, I didn't work with them. I didn't work with anyone else. I tried because I was told early on when the, we first had the idea of doing a book that I, I was useless with writing. So I, 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 I talked to a couple of different people, both of whom I respect enormously, mm-hmm. and nothing came of that. I didn't really like what they wanted to do particularly. So I sort of dumped it. And then eventually I got a publishing deal, and the publisher said, we want you to write it, show us something you've written, and I did, and they said, that's fine. So I wrote everything. No, it took me a year. Wow. That's incredible. So yeah, I mean, you're telling great stories in that too. Um, that's 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 the part that I was really curious. It was a lot of times that's a just because you live the story doesn't mean you're very good at storytelling. And I in in general for for a lot of people. So I find it very interesting that you were able to sit down, recall all these moments, and actually keep them. You know, uh, the storytelling aspect of a book like cohesive. You know, it's 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 really cool. And I, I mean. I'm glad to hear that you were the one doing it because sometimes, as I said, you know, you get an interviewer in there and they, they like to uh, add their own interpretations to your story, if I will. Yeah, I, 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 I would have been quite happy if, if it had worked out with either of the two people I tried to do it with because mm-hmm. they're both really well-respected writers. 
But uh, as it turned out, I had to do it myself. And it's, I'm, it's lovely to hear that you, you're not bored rigid by it. That's great. No, yeah. not at all. I have to- I have to just interject here. Oh, yeah, go for one it. of the one, one, one of the things that I loved the most when I first read the book was that if you know Dad and you know how he speaks, it literally jumps at you off the page because it, it's his it's his way of saying and relaying things. And so if you know, like if you've heard him tell stories at a dinner table, or you know you're familiar with how he you know phrases things and the words that he uses everything in that book is a hundred percent him. And it was like, it, it made me kind of emotional. Cause I was like, how fucking great to have this, like in his own word, like so truly in his own words, like as a collection, I think my only, my only thing that I like would have loved with, it would have been if he had read the audio book rather than having like an actor do it because I love, I mean, dad used to read bedtime stories every night until I was about 12 and I had to ask him to stop. <laughs> because, I know. I was like, I'm 12 now, dad. I don't really need bedtime stories anymore. But when I, obviously my mum and my mum and dad split when I was eight. And I think it was like a nice little bonding time, like having my bedtime Absolutely. stories. But once, I, once I got to like being 12, I was a bit like, I'm a bit grown up for this now. And we were both kind of upset about it, but like, yeah. I, I had to have no. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Otherwise, it was good. It was a good time. <laughs> I, did, I didn't have any say in who read the book. Uh, no, it's, it's a it's shame. It's an English Shakespearean actor, I think. That, uh, mm. I heard a few lines of the first chapter and I've not listened to it since. Uh, um, it, didn't, it didn't appeal to me particularly, but I'm sure the guy did the best job he could. But there we are. You're listening to it. And you're, I'm, listening to it. You're I'm listening to it. I'm listening to it. it. Hey, I, I'm still getting the stories and it's still coming through. So for me, it's working, you know, I mean, oh, I couldn't imagine, yeah. I couldn't imagine someone like re, someone else reading my material though. You know, like if I was the one. Yeah, it's doing, pretty weird, particularly he doesn't know me, even, you know. It, like, yeah. Whatever. It's fine. It is. Yeah. Well, it's not too late for two things in, in, in this story that I'm hearing. One, you can, you could get behind a microphone and reread it all if you want. Two, I, Charlie, it's not too late. You, you can still have them read your bedtime stories. I hope <laughs> <I> can, <laughs> I, I hope that I can still read my son that time stories when he turns 40. Over FaceTime. Yeah, over FaceTime. Oh, oh, you, guys, you, guys didn't do that, you guys didn't do that in New York when you were in New York together? A little... A little no. Fuck no. 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 We, hey, I, we, I, we, I, I think your father would love it. I think you would love it as well. I'm just saying, don't, don't knock it till you try it. It might be the way listen, to go. Listen, he's, he's, 80, he's 80 now, so it might be me reading him bedtime stories. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, wow. <laughs> shots fired. <laughs> Family shots fired. That's again there. That's again there. And then I'm wiping um, away the dribble. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, isn't exactly. that how it's supposed you to you be? Your it, is, it is Father's Day, Charlie. Isn't it? You're supposed to be taking care of your dad. That's that's the whole I thing. Mean, yeah, well. When he needs it, I will, obviously. But he doesn't, so. <laughs> he clearly he doesn't. Got, like, he, he's incredible. Like, he's incre- like, you would never know that he's as old as he is if, you know, you didn't know it like he's he's, right. he's so active he plays golf all the time he's always in the garden like he can move man. through like his mobility man. is still incredible i can yep. still walk still walk you still walk you know, yeah. he's still here oh, yeah. you walking? i can feed myself it's marvelous <laughs> are you walking the courses still glenn are you on the are you have you moved uh, on the i don't it always depends on the course if it's flat i walk. i i uh, walk it. yeah yeah what's your handicap oh my brain <laughs> that's a go- that's a golfing man's a- answer right oh, there. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Do you, do you golf too, Charlie? Have you guys ever golfed together? No. We we I went with him once when I was a teenager and all I did was drive the buggy, so I didn't actually like play any golf. Um and we, we, when I moved out here, we said we would do it when he came to visit me, but we still haven't done it. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. I've never played golf, but I obviously have lots of friends that love it. And obviously dad has always loved golf. So um, I'm up for learning. I just, again, with my impatience for things that I'm not very good at immediately, I'm not sure how uh, patient I would be with golf because from what I understand, it's quite a long like learning process to be good at right oh like, yeah it, it, and even and no one's ever really good at it unless you're one of the pros right. on the tour you're not really that good at it you're still gonna hit bad shots all the time and to that point oh, even the pros right. even the pros will you watch the pga tours even the best guys out there will will shank a shot every once in a while and it's like oh shit like okay there's never well, been if, if it was if it was that easy we, we wouldn't be doing it you know you need a bit of a challenge mm-hmm. 
I do love that aspect. I just got into golf three and a half years ago. Um, and I love that aspect about it because it is, it, it, to your point, Glenn, it is like, it's kind of mimics life to me. Like you, you're constantly working on yourself and challenging and you're still going to continue to fuck up until the day you die. But you're gotta, you keep trying to make less mistakes, I guess. So I think that's like, uh, I, really, I really brought it akin to, to golf. And man, when did you start golfing then, Glenn? Was, is, was this back in the oh, 60s, late. 70s? I, I was probably 50-ish, some, around 50, something like that. Okay. Yeah, I didn't have time before that. I, I was too busy. Oh, yeah. Well, on our first conversation, I made the joke, you know, with uh, all, the, all the busyness that you had for the 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s, how did you even have time to procreate and create, Charlie? <laughs> oh, good question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's I don't thing. remember. No, I mean... Well, I, I, Go on. I think I, I I came I came around a slightly calmer time in your in your schedule than Ethan and Abigail for sure, and yeah. I, 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 apparently I was conceived in NASA at Chris uh, Blackwell's house. Apparently, according to Mum, um, okay. he's well, gonna go. go he's gonna now. go with that story, that's, Charlie. He's going with that one. He's like, sure, yeah. let's go. That, that'll <laughs> do. If, you, if that's what your mum says, who am I? To it's, what, it's what she thinks. So you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Totally nice. Yeah. nice place to be conceived. Yeah. Yep. I mean, Bahamas? Yeah. Like, come on. That sounds like a great yeah, place. Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> have, you, have you played any rounds of golf with uh, any of any, anybody from the 60s and 70s that have gotten into it as well? Like some people you've worked with perhaps in the, uh, over the years? Or are you just kind of playing with a lot of your buddies? No, uh, no funny enough, not. Uh, the people I play with now from the music business, Mike Rutherford I play with quite okay. a lot from, from Genesis. Um, and... Guy Fletcher from Dire Straits, I play with him pretty much every week. Um, but that's it from um, as I used to play with Scott Gorham. Charlie mentioned uh, the, the guy from Thin Lizzy, the guitar player in Thin Lizzy. Great guitar player, actually. He's yes, American. absolutely. I love Thin Lizzy. Uh, and a bloody good golfer, too. So I used to play with him. But other than that, not, not anybody else in the music business I can think of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just curious is, I know for me, I, I love getting out. I, I play with my bandmates. That's who I generally play. Oh, with. cool. Yeah. Yeah. So. Great. If you're on the road, you go, go and play nine hours or something, you know, Right. That, well, that's, that's, that's yeah. going to be the idea. I mean, our singer has been doing that for years. He take days off and go and go play golf on a day off while we're out on tour. And I was always like, why are you wasting your time with that? I'm just going to go to Hooters and have some drinks. Ah, ah. It's a day it's off. It's a man. great thing to do, particularly <laughs> on the road. Because you, no, yeah. you know, being on the road, you've got two hours of activity and 22 of killing time. Oh, yeah. The hurry up and wait is, is yeah, as yeah. we call it. You know, there's not a lot yeah. of, there's a lot of downtime before everyone yeah. sees those two hours a night on stage. There's a lot of other shit going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah. But I've seen the light now. I'm, I'm excited to bring my golf clubs out when we finally get back out on the road. I'm going to be bringing my clubs with me and have very cool. It's good. It's good for your mental well being. It's good for your health. It's good for everything. A bit of balance. There's something else to think about. Very cool. Definitely. It's a great game. And I think the best thing about golf is you can literally go anywhere in the world and get a game. And I've met some really interesting people through golf. But uh, most of my friends locally to where I live now, I've met entirely through golf. When I lived in France for a few years, the same thing happened there. I, I, my social life revolved around uh, people I met through golf. Right. And I think that's great. That's how you, I mean, in the industry, we all, what we, we're all a part of here, including Charlie, you're, you're around the same people, right? Over yeah. and over and again. Yeah. And it's great. Yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong, but how are you going to, there's a lot of world outside of music, believe it or not. And you need to be able to talk about something other than music or touring or your next album or whatever it is. You need to be able to talk about. Yeah. Cause that shit gets boring, man. Whatever. <laughs> you talk, I mean, like, you talk about it all day. I mean, it's certainly doing what I do. You know, I, like oh. I'm on calls all day talking about like the state of the media and like the landscape. And then when I get together with my friends that work in on, on this side of the fence, that's all we do too. And we have to like, I have to go, can we stop talking about work now? Because yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah. Like we've spent all day, we spend all day doing this. Like, can we just stop it now? And it's, yeah, you do, you need people that have nothing to do with it. I think 
to stimulate the other part of your brain a little bit better that is like not completely focused on like why so and so outlet isn't covering this bands anymore or whatever you know like it's it, otherwise it just gets completely draining yeah and would you uh glenn would you want charlie to come out and golf with you is that something you'd, you'd want? <laughs> uh probably not uh, no, i'd love to come along yeah uh, um uh, and listen if she wants to that'd be great yeah i've played with my son um yeah and we have a great time and I'm sure I would with Charlie if she wanted to come that'd be fantastic you kidding All right. I, think I, fun. I, I just think I think I'd be crap at it but oh, no, 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 no. I don't think that that's not important no I'm it's crap not. at it now you know it's fine I am absolutely yeah. terrible I've only been playing for three and a half months <laughs> like I I am stoked when I get below a hundred <laughs> on a round like I am fucking <laughs> I am <laughs> terrible hey listen if you've only been playing that long and you're doing that that's very cool I should think you are stoked good on you bro. I am stoked the thing about golf is you have to practice it no matter where you are and in, in, you know how far along you are how many years you played if you don't practice fairly regularly you can lose it so you've got to put a bit of a few hours in which I actually really enjoy. I enjoy the practices. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been great during the, the last couple of years of the pandemic. There wasn't anything else to do. So I'd go out yeah, on the golf exactly. course like three, four times a week. And that's how I practiced. It was, yeah, so I, I, yeah. I bring all this up to say, Charlie, you're in LA. Why don't, mm. you, why don't you come out and golf with me a couple of times and see how uh, you like it? Okay. And we'll, sure. we'll, see if we, we, we'll see if we could get you in a, in a nice place the next time you're around your dad. You guys can, you guys can go out and golf together. What do you think? Okay, sure. I'd love that. That would be awesome. Golfing with me is not like is not stressful. By the way, I no, I, I, no, I, 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 I golf is kind of secondary to my drinking out there. So that's like what we're gonna do. <laughs> You'll have a great okay. time. I promise. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> I'm 100 percent now. Now, getting back to your part of the industry, Charlie, uh, I, I've heard I've heard your dad talk about. Uh, never, never needing the media for for his side of things, and never really caring for the media uh, uh, early on, uh, because you know. And I think you pointed it out very well, Glenn, in a couple of interviews or something that I was listening to. Maybe it was in the book, um, where you know, every the media loves you, loves you, loves you, push, pu- pushes you up, and then when that's no longer interesting to the public anymore then they're going to start knocking you back down. And now it's, they're mm-hmm. taking those headlines. And you put, you put it in such a great way, Glenn, because I was uh, early on, especially with that UK press, you cheeky monkeys out there, they got us good a few times with those headlines, you know? And it had nothing to do with who we were, but the, that's the imagery that everyone got for a while there. So how, yeah. my question is, how do you guys feel? Like, first, Glenn, how do you feel about her being part of the press now? And uh, something that you didn't really necessarily care for in your career. Um, okay, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of her doing what she's doing. Right. I think of it's course. brilliant. More importantly, Charlie enjoys the job enormously, and that's all that really counts. You've got to be able to enjoy what you're doing, and very few people actually do a job that they really enjoy to that extent. So she's very lucky to have found something that she does to that extent. I know I don't dislike the media intensely. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I realise that, particularly from a uh, if you're a performer. You, you need publicity in order to get people to tip, tip up and buy a ticket to your show uh, or to buy your record. So it's it's an essential part of the process. And I think Charlie's particularly brilliant at what she does. I mean, I'm biased, obviously, but I think she's particularly brilliant at what she does. And I'm very proud of the fact she does it. I have never had to rely on the media for anything. I mean, until I released the book, which was only recently, you know. That's the only time I've ever used the media to promote something because... I had something to promote. Other than that, it's never me. It's always the artist. I mean, my work to right. carry by, by that. Um, so I think what she's doing is brilliant. And more importantly, as I say, the fact that she enjoys it to the extent she does means a lot. And she's very fortunate to have achieved yeah. what she's done. There you go. No, that's, that's great to hear. And that, that is every father's dream for their child to just be yeah. happy in whatever exactly they do. Exactly right. Whatever they do. Exactly that's, right. That's, that's yeah. the, that is the key. Now, now that we've got a little bit of a mushiness going your way, Charlie, let's throw it back. And uh, why don't you tell me about growing up and learning that your dad was a legendary Glenn Johns and had done all these great records. Which one was your favorite out of all of those? And what, what, is, what, is, the, what is the thing that you take away from uh, your father's work? Oh my god! Um, 
so there's like three parts to that. So like growing up around it, like dad, I think we touched on this when we tried to do this before, but like dad is very humble about what he's done and doesn't make a big deal out of it. Doesn't call any kind of um, accolade or any of that stuff, you know? And like, I think I was telling you that like, the majority of his like platinum and gold discs that he's got, of which there are obviously many, uh, all hang in his uh, garage yeah. rather than in the house because he just doesn't like he, he has one in his on the office. wall his, his interior designer didn't put him up on the wall for him like me <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more my stepmom as well like I yeah. think she thinks it's a bit ostentatious um, but he did, <laughs> he did right. use that I mean, he, yeah he's got a couple and there's one in his office which you can't see now but um, that is the uh, for the best of the Eagles, which is the best, which at the time was the best selling album of the 20th century, which is obviously pretty fucking amazing. Um, but yeah, so growing up around, I mean, obviously I knew that I was very lucky and, you know, um, very privileged and very, you know, growing up around, we had a, we had a studio recording, like dad's recording studio was in, was at our house in like, we lived on like a big farm, like big farm land. And um, we, we, um, Dad had converted the stable block for the, from the farm into like a studio and a, an apartment for bands to stay in. So, you know, I was constantly around people making music, which was incredible. Um, and that was that, like, when you're a kid and that's your norm, you don't, you obviously know that you're lucky, but you don't really know that there's a lot that's different to that. And it wasn't until I got to university and I started dating a guy who was obsessed with like the 60s and 70s and like all of the stuff that dad had done in that era, like, you know, The Clash and Led Zeppelin and The Stones and all of that good stuff. He started, you know, sort of being like, you need to listen to this and you need to appreciate like your like, like your family's legacy because this is insane that you don't really like know anything. Like, like not like no, but I just, I'd never, like, I, I guess I'd never sort it out. And then obviously once I started learning about like just what he had done and the impact that those records have had and like uh, certainly on stuff that I listen to now like at the time and like it, it, being a teenager in the UK obviously it, it, uh, late in the 90s Oasis and Blur were obviously the big big bands so and like the impact that the majority of what that has done like on those bands is fucking huge so that was pretty wild. And then, yeah, once I started learning about it, obviously, I, you know, obviously I'm incredibly proud of everything that he's done. I'm incredibly proud to be his daughter and, you know, be part, you know, not be part of that legacy. I'm not part of that legacy, but like, you know, be related to it, I guess. Um, I go, so the, the, the favorite album. Yeah. Yeah. So like out of all the stuff, because I know, like you just said, it's, just so you know, too, it's it's hard to be retrospective on any of that, by the way, even if you're the, I mean, Glenn, you could probably attest to that. Like, I'm just, I don't even have half the accomplishments that your father does. But for me, like, just in the last couple of years, I'm like, sitting at home going, wow, I have done some pretty cool shit in my life already. But you don't think of it while you're doing it at all. Like, it's just, it's not right. a thought. So for you to grow right. up in that, I could obviously see how you just be like, yeah, not until I... Try, got a little bit older into my adult years and started being retrospective on how I grew up and wh what my father's stuff meant. I mean, you just nailed it. I mean, that, that, that makes perfect sense to me that you wouldn't think of it that way. No, and I like, like Pete Townsend from The Who gave me a piano for my fifth birthday, right? Jesus. Which is fucking amazing, <laughs> right? I, I, I That's a hell like, of a birthday was, present. <laughs> it, it was just Uncle Pete giving me a piano. Like, you know, wow. I was five. You Uncle, know, like, oh, it's a piano. I can make loads of noise of it. Like, Uncle Pete you know, giving you a piano on your fifth birthday. That is... But, but like that, yeah. But to me, like, I, I like it. It sounds obnoxious and awful from my perspective no, right now. But like, no, no, it's But at the time, you know, like, you're a kid, you're five, you don't know, you know. And I, it's funny. I bumped into Pete at the Classic Rock Awards in like it must have been 2013 or 2014, and I went up to him and I introduced myself and. Like you, you, you will probably definitely not recognize me, but I'm Glenn's daughter, and you, you gave me a piano when I was five. He was like, "Oh my god, Charlie!" And like, it was really sweet that he remembered. And he's like, "Oh my god, did you ever, you know, did you play the piano?" And I was like, "I tried to learn for a bit, but it wasn't, you know, whatever." Um, <laughs> but that was, but that was really sweet, you know, and 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 cool that I that I had that moment. Oh my god, sorry, Jesus. What are you apologizing for? We're good. Jesus, What's that's that? so loud. Sorry. No. My phone was ringing. Oh, <laughs> phone was ringing. I, I didn't even, we didn't you even hear it on our end. You can hear it. I was like, shit, you can hear it. Ah. 
And, um, and we have ears. We have ears. We're, you know. I know why. I, I, thought, if, I thought maybe it would pick up or whatever because it was no, no, whatever. No. Anyway, yes, so that was, that was really nice. And then in terms of the, my favorite record, I mean, I think I really, really, really love the first Eagles record. Like mm. the, the Eagles vocal harmonies do something to my like physical being that I can't quite put my finger on, but like it's just one of the best sounds ever like those like four or five part harmonies so just good. like i don't know like i don't know what it is but like, i could listen to that all day um and then you know obviously you have to shout out led Zep, led Zep one because i think the impact of what they started as a band on the majority of the music that i work on now cannot be denied um not to mention the stereo not to mention the stereo drums known as the glenn right. johns effect now so yep um, but you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan. And then, you know, like the, the early stone stuff he did, like fucking amazing. Like, so it's, it's really difficult to pick one because it, he's got such a diverse body of work. Like he's worked on so many different styles and different genres. Like there would be different things I would pick for different moods, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, but I would, I think if, if I have to single something out, it would probably be Led Zeppelin one or the first Eagles record. Those are my two. Both brilliant. Both brilliant. And I, I love that you pointed out on uh, the Eagles stuff, the, the four and five part harmonies. Um, I, God, again, going back to the way you recorded things, Glenn, you got, you had to have a band that had four or five guys that could carry a tune to be able to do that. Cause you're, you're not probably doing a lot of overdubbing. I wouldn't imagine if you're doing, uh, you know, from the, from, from what I'm learning about your style, I couldn't imagine it, it was pr primarily live, right? Yes, the, the, the vocals were invariably overdubbed, of course. Yeah. Um, but the first Eagles album was done eight track. Yeah. So, um, so you know. How do you? Yeah. Me. How do you do that? You got a, You got a, You got one mic and four, four or five guys around it. How do you? How are you pulling it off? I, I, with uh, with most of the vocal backing, I did. I did it in stereo with two mics. Okay. Just you know, just them in, in a semicircle. Them in a semicircle, uh, two mics. Yeah. Stereo. Uh, I mean, okay. I, there may have been lots of occasions where I used one, but I, I seem to remember doing it stereo if I had enough tracks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's interesting what Charlie's saying. Oh, the, I get a lot of credit for records that made a dent with everybody, but the reality is, it's the, the artist that everyone's and the and the material, the songs, the, the, the performance. That's the the key to the success, in my view. I was able to capture it and maybe enhance it very slightly with an arrangement idea or whatever. You know, I was certainly sitting in the booth and picking the tape that, that is the one as against the previous ones that weren't, if you like. But really and truly, a big big. It's sort of. I, I get quite embarrassed because I get the credit for something that really I was lucky to be in the room with, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, the that's, way that's, I that's your it. humility talking, you know, no, and well, I love it's, that. It's, and no, no, it's, it's your reality too, right? I mean, that, no, it's absolutely my reality. I mean, I, I worked with the Royal States for 13 years, I think. Wow. Um, I, I, I can't ever, I mean, there may have been the only occasion where I had an idea, but if they, there was always a producer was, uh, and I was just the engineer. And I worked very closely with Mick and Keith. Um, and yes, I was responsible for recording the stuff, but they wrote it and they performed it. And uh, Led Zeppelin walked into the studio ready to rock. I mean, they were rehearsed. They knew exactly what they wanted to do. I had a couple of ideas while we were, while we were making the record. And I, you know, I, I did get the sound on it. But I mean, frankly, they were giving me the sound for me to get, you know, I mean, the trick, the trick from my perspective with all the people I've worked with, which is quite different from a lot of records that are made now, is that my biggest problem is to try and recreate the sound that the band is giving me. It's their sound. So Pete Townsend's guitar sound is his. John Edwards' bass sound was his. Uh, Keith Moon's drum sound was... That was, that was all his. That was all his. So there's, there's no other. <laughs> We could go on. Yeah. So the, 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 the difficulty and the, the, the degree of difficulty was to try and recreate their live sound coming out of two small speakers, a record player, if you like. 
um, rather than sitting in an auditorium having it wanged at you through 5,000 watts of wallop, you know. Um, and that, 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 is, that I can take credit for. But other than that, listen, I didn't write the songs and I didn't play them. And, and that to me is what really everyone gets emotional about is the, is the performance of a piece of music written by somebody else. And as I say, I've, I know for a fact that I've been unbelievably lucky to be in the room when a lot of shit's gone down, you know, with some pretty cool people. And it, it, going back to Charlie talking about her childhood just now, interestingly, we didn't lead, although we had the studio in the, on the premises and all that, we didn't lead a rock and roll lifestyle. We led a very normal, conservative sort of uh, life. And the fact that musicians would come by every now and then, they were always very well behaved and very respectful. Uh, and the, the Who, I mean, Pete and I had been mates since we were kids. I mean, they, we, we all had. So yeah, we were friends. Yeah, you grew up with Dalton, Jimmy Page like, yeah. and, and, and yeah, everybody. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So when, when the Who came to the house, it wasn't like a bunch of hooligans coming. You know, they were all pals. And they obviously adored Charlie. And Pete gave her a penny, like she said. We, you know, that's just part of the deal, really. Yeah. Hmm. Not, nothing to do with rock and roll. But but that's completely abnormal for the, for most people, you know. That right. doesn't. Oh, no, that that is, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. People listening right now. I oh yeah, that seems so casual. Let's just have Pete Townsend over. Let's have the entire who. who. Let's uh, let's have uh, Uncle Jimmy over. Why not? Let's just. Let's, let's, <laughs> They'll sit around the piano and maybe just have an impromptu uh, jam session. You know, that's that's very common <laughs> to to happen, right? Well, right. No, no, no. I, um, Chuck, yeah, yeah. Chuck, Chuck. I, can't, I can't remember who it was, but someone like when 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 we used to have like Sunday lunch dinner party or like like lunch parties or whatever. Someone used to arrive in a helicopter, and, like drop the helicopter in the field. To, I, I I can't remember who it was, but it might have been it was Kenny. Kenny probably Kenny. Uh, Jones. Kenny Jones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again. <laughs> Such an average life uh, to be brought yeah. around. Well, man. <laughs> yeah, okay. Turning up, turning, up for din- turning up for dinner in a fucking helicopter <laughs> in a field. Like, that's I, I, not... I, I, I don't know. That's how, I go, to, that's how I go to dinner. Like that. That's how I go to dinner. I don't have a car. I don't know what you're talking about. I only go to restaurants with a with a helipad on top. That's the, it it, kind of limits, it limits you where you can eat, but I tell you what, those places are really oh. good. Hold on, yep. the helicopter thing wasn't a common occurrence, otherwise you wouldn't remember it. <laughs> no, it happened more than once though, and I remember... Oh yeah, don't, don't quite you all, I remember, by the helicopter once, I remember, yeah. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. like, yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember being quite, like, awestruck by it as a child. Yeah, it's pretty weird. Yeah, of yeah. course. I mean, but that's awesome, though. You got those experiences, and and for you, Glenn, and for for you, Charlie, that you got those experiences, and you're able to recall them and and talk about your childhood that way. And then for Glenn to be able to provide that life for you, it's got to be uh, as as a as a new father myself. My son's only five. I can only imagine. Like, I'm 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 excited to get back on the road and take him with me, and and be able to show him all these cool places and these cool things. You know. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. 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 Yeah, you know, he'll, he'll he'll grow up and he'll realize what they meant. Like I think, like I, like, I mean, obviously, I, I don't, I don't know your son or whatever, but like, um, you got a fur you know, puppy, for, you got a fur kid. I saw that fur. Kid. I, yeah, I do. Like, I, like, and you know, like when you grow up and you realize like the magnitude of like what your parent, who is just you know to you, like dad's always just been dad to me, and he's been you know he's an incredible father. He's always been there. He's been you know, like an incredible friend as much as anything else, certainly as I've become, you know, as I moved from being a kid into an adult, you know, like he's always just been my dad. But when you start when, realizing, I, saw, when I stopped reading your stories, I became your friend. <laughs> yes, exactly. There you go. There you go. Um, and, um, you know, it wasn't until later in life that I really started to realize what those memories meant and when, how, like, whilst they were just my life to me, like when you talk to other people and other people are like, oh my God, you know, you got to see this or whatever, you were there when that, or like look at this photo of you with so-and-so or whatever, like, and you realise that that isn't actually very normal and like what, it, what that actually means to other people and therefore how lucky you are that that was your life. Like that's really special. So having those memories and like being able to do that with your kid and like having, having him what you play to you know thousands and thousands of people and all that stuff will be will be amazing for him right 
you know, and I, you know, that's, I mean, that's the motivation at this point in my life. I've, I've done it right. long enough. Like now it's like, I want to show the next generation, i.e. my son, you know. And I think you touched upon a couple of things there, Charlie. It, it does bring back to the humility of your father that, you, you know, Glenn, you, you raised her in a very normal way in the sense of you just being a father, you know, like not... Not I'm Glenn Johns or anything like that. I'm I'm your dad. Like I, I I still get it around the club and everything. Like oh that's Frankie's dad. I don't have a name anymore. I'm just Frankie's dad. You know, and it, it's 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 pretty. But I love it. You know what I mean? Like I'm like yeah, yeah I am. Yeah. Like yeah, that's yeah. fucking fantastic. And it goes into that humility. Yeah, yeah. Just want to point out to everyone at home. He's very humble. But there was a common denominator in all of those records that we grew up loving. So let's 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 point that out real quick. Right. I. I, I, I do I do agree with this I, I do agree and I think you know like I, I I I get what Dad's saying because I think you know like of course and that's take, that's take, such a take, great take, take that's for, a great human take to have on those experiences like that's of course like take Spirit Box for instance I'm wearing that shirt today but you know I, I I get a lot of bands coming to me being like oh we want to work with you because you work with Spirit Box and you did such a great campaign for them and you know whatever and you know obviously for a brand new band, to, um, you know, a brand new band that are heavy and, and, you know, in that genre to have a top 20, top 200, not like rock chart or whatever, like the actual Billboard top 200, to have a top 20 record as their debut record. It's fucking incredible. But I always say to people, like, I did a great job because the record was great and that band are phenomenal. Like, I, I can't do that job if the music isn't good. You know, so I get what Dad is saying 100%. You know, I can, I can put you in front of all of the same people that I put Spirit Box in front of but unless your record is as good as that, people may not want to write about it, you know, and it's the, it's the same thing. I'm good at my job. I, I have good relationships. I know who to talk to. I have a good understanding of audiences and who will write about who and who in the media likes what, et cetera, et cetera. But like, I can't make people write about things like the band and the record have to work for the media in order for that to be a thing. So I do understand what they're saying, but yeah, but yeah, I completely agree with you that there is a common denominator and a common, you know, thread that runs through all of those releases that is undeniably him. So it's sort of bit of one, bit of the other, you know? Well, I think you just brought it around full circle because before when I was asking you how you stumbled upon this, uh, this line of work that you're in, in PR, you said it found you. And I think you just, you just nailed it right there. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree there. You, 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 you mm. put it in that analogy that makes perfect sense. You know, they're like, you have the same philosophy as your dad. It's just in a different capacity, but it's the same thing. It's the same idea. You have to have a good record for me to, to be able to help, you know, and it starts 100, there. Yeah, 100%. Like, I can't, I can't PR something if it's good, you know, people aren't going to want to write about it. Um, and I think, you know, like, back to the question that you asked me, it was like kind of several questions in one. Yeah, like the, that's, that's you know, how I like the, to do it so that you could just like, you know, have to think yeah. about it the whole time, you know? <laughs> yeah. They're like, you know, the, 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 the big, the big, one of the biggest things for me, you know, from, from like a standpoint of the fact that I know also work in music is that, you know, watching dad and how hard he worked and how, and how he operated with the bands that he works with and the line between professionalism and, professionalism, you know, like dad saying, you know, you can't, you can't be an engineer and be fucked up like everybody else. You have to be the responsible one. You know, I kind of, uh, like I take that with me with my job as well. And I'm, you know, I'm always questioning what's appropriate and what isn't appropriate, but given my role and like, you know, I'm not, there's a lot of people that do things on the business side of the fence that are just there because they want to hang out with famous people and, you know, do blow backstage or what, you know, whatever the fuck it is. Yeah. And like, that's, that's not, not me at all. Like, right. no, I, I want to do a great job and I want people to respect me as a professional, you know, and like I very much pick that, that ethic and that work approach from what you dad all those years. Yeah, I mean, that, and you know that was a big thing for me. It's obvious because right now you're the one drinking water while me and your father have. Uh... <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, uh, before I, I want to thank you guys again for your time, but before we get get out of here, I'd be remiss to not go back to uh, the exhibit and talk a little bit about get back. A quick backstory for me, uh, Glenn is. I didn't get into the Beatles or the Stones until I was in my mid twenties, and I got these records on vinyl. I wasn't the, the, these; these just weren't bands that were played in my uh, house. Zeppelin was. I get it. I get it. And yeah. then, but you know, going back and ingratiating myself with these as an adult really um, was kind of a rad experience because I thought of music differently at that point, you know. Um, and listening to these records in what I called my speakeasy, where I'd have cigars and scotch and play the vinyl of these records. 
And I loved doing this through my 20s. And one of the records that I gravitated towards, not knowing who you were or anything at the time, was Let It Be. Now, of course, I was listening to the version that you've described as puke um, with with those mixes. But um, now that I've gone back and listened to it and knowing that the working title was Get Back, everyone famously will know now because of Disney Plus, all that footage that Peter Jackson went back to. I mean... I that was let it be was a great record to me because not because the sonic mixes or anything but the writing of it was so different and now that we've been able to see the documentary that I didn't really know about I just I really gravitated towards because that that was an experimental record they were doing a live record in a weird sound stage like it was a very unorthodox thing for the time and then of course you and Ringo famously talking about hey let's throw it up on the roof for the live setting and then it becomes this iconic thing for the band for so many years. So, so much that, that there's an exhibit about it. There's a fucking documentary about it. And your, your, your finger's in all of it. You know, like, can you take me, like, I know that you've probably had so many of these questions about this because it's the thing that everyone's talking about right now. But can you bring me into your perspective of being a part of Get Back or Let It Be? Um, <clears throat> okay. Having, having worked with the Stones for so long, um, right up through this 1969 when I got the call, well, I got the call in December 1968 from Paul McCartney to ask me to go along and, and do the get back thing. It was based on the fact that he wanted to make a live album of all new material, which no one has ever done. Even to, to this day, no one's ever done that. So, so ambitious, I mean, so ambitious. Well, I mean, well, only they could pull it off. Maybe right. the Stones could, but certainly the Beatles. I mean, with the quality, I mean, the, the interest in them. But don't forget, in 1969, they were the biggest act in the world by times 100. I mean, right. just they couldn't go anywhere on the planet without somebody knowing who they were and recognizing and all that. So it was pretty huge. So the fact that he was calling me was. Uh, it was a shock because they, as you know, they've been working, or perhaps you don't, they'd been working with George Martin as their producer and a guy called Jeff Emmerich was their engineer at Abbey Road forever and, and other other engineers than Jeff, but Jeff was the, was the main guy. And they proved, they'd rewritten the rule book as far as produced records were concerned with Sergeant Pepper. Uh, and this was sort of the complete, Going back to the beginning, the four of them sitting around playing and singing. So cool. So cool. It, it's unbelievably cool. And so I obviously I jumped to that. I mean, I wasn't going to say no. Um, <laughs> right. Um, I had no idea that George Martin wasn't going to be producing it, which I found out as we went along. Um, although he did, he did come along on some days and sort of hovered about keeping a BDR on proceedings. Um, the main thing was I'd never worked with them before. I knew Paul, I'd met Paul previously, and I'd met John and Paul together. Uh, they came in and sang back up on a Stones single uh, that I did. So, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd met them. Um, but I didn't, really, I didn't really quite know what I was letting myself in for. So I walk into the first day at, on the sound stage at Trickenham, um, a little bit apprehensive. But within minutes, they all made me feel so welcome. It was very cool. And, and by the end of the day, it was like we'd been working together for years. And they, they were really cool. They were very cool. And it was an odd time for the four of them. They had seen each other for 18 months. The, the last album they'd made was 18 months previously. Um, Yoko was introduced to the band on, on the first day um, and was, was a presence, uh, which was a little odd for everyone, I think. Um, it was, it, and, and actually the other three weren't that kick. It was Paul's idea. The other three were going along and turning up to support Paul, but they weren't absolutely convinced in, of the idea. They thought it might be a bit odd. And that became apparent as the days went by, they decided uh, they didn't really want to do it, you know, the way Paul did. So that was, it, that was interesting. Oh, yeah, <laughs> was, to say the least. You know, well, I never quite knew where, where we were. And yeah. frankly, if, if, if there hadn't been a documentary being made about the making of the TV show, which is what the live concert was going to be. Yeah, it was, yeah. I don't know what would have happened, but since we, we were, every day was being filmed, we got to the point where we needed an end to the film, never mind about, 
the, the concert, whether it happened or not. Uh, and also we, were, we needed to make an album, which is the film uh, displays really well, I think. Yeah, so you, so you you've obviously watched the documentary. Have you watched all three parts and <coughs> yeah. you all cut? Okay, how? That's another question in itself. And I, how how does that feel to look back at that so many years later and see Peter Jackson's interpretation rather of what's going on? And and I mean, he's using those mixes in the room. So those weren't your mixes. Those weren't even the other guys' mixes of some of these songs. They they obviously had to bring in their own mixing, right, f- to create this documentary. Okay, the, the, all the stuff at, uh, at Twickenham on the sound stage mm-hmm. was recorded in mono on a Nagra with a boom mic. So that's all there was. Wow. Um, yeah. And then when we moved into Savile Row, I had an eight-track machine and that's all my stuff. I did record some stuff at Twickenham, but the tapes got lost. Wow, that's, that's a travesty. No, no, one, no one knows where they are. Wow. Sure. Well, I will say going back now and listening to the mix and having seen the the documentary, the mix that you did, you could definitely see why that was the, the, the goal. Like your mix makes more sense for what the goal originally was. Like it just, it just does. Cause yeah, it when, you, when I, when I referred to, to a load of puke, I was, I was referring to Phil Spector's version and what he did. I think he puked all over it. Basically, he, he, polished, he polished it up and turned it into a recorded album, not yeah, a live but, album. Yeah, and it's, and it's nothing to do with what we were about at all. Mm-hmm. And, um, hey, enough said. Yeah. So, I mean, I got, I, I had become very convinced that uh, while we were doing the record, while, while we were working on the material, that, what ended up as my version was going to be the only way it was ever going to be an album, to be honest with you. And I wanted to show, like the film does, I wanted it to be a fly on the wall and have the full starts and them t- taking the mickey out of each other and all that. Because I was witnessing that and I'm thinking, God, you know, I'm sitting in here watching this going on. Wouldn't it be great if everyone else could see what this is? Because you actually get the interaction between the four guys. Because um, you, you never see that. You, you see them all mm-hmm. interviewed as a force. Never seen that. That's why it's the coolest uh, fucking thing in the world. I'm yeah, so glad exactly. they finally released it, and everyone can yeah. get. I mean, your your version was like the first bootleg of any record that like went like everyone wanted to hear. Like that's that's incredible. Like, and listening back to it, being in a band now, uh, that dynamic between musicians and friends who are in a room just working together. You've seen it a million times. I've been a part of it, maybe not a million, but a few less times, but still been a part of it. No one else, going back to this normal life of like Charlie, like like for you, like what a, what a normal life would be growing up, you don't realize it until later when you're being uh, introspective or retrospective of it, that right. that's not normal for other people to experience. So like like when they're watching, they're like, oh my God, this band is insane. What the hell were they trying to do? And I'm sitting there going like, this is interesting. This is exactly what we all do when we get yeah. together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I've, yeah. Been doing, I've been doing that with the Stones for years. I mean, Mick and yeah. Keith wrote in the studio all the time. The Small Faces wrote in the studio. Everybody did, you know. They, everybody wrote. That, that process was quite normal. And actually, I think it's a great way to record. If you write in the studio, you can... You can put it down and listen to it and see how bad it is. And, you know, you, you can use the recording as a tool to help you develop the material. Right. No, that's that's a brilliant point right there. Listening back and, like, uh, going back and messing with the parts yeah. and stuff. Like, that's something we do yeah. now in Pro Tools pretty easily. But back then, I mean, you're filming it and you're like, all right, come back in here because this part was really good. Like, what do you guys think about expanding upon this? You know, that's that's a great way of, of writing, especially for the day. Um Man, such a cool fucking piece of history, music history. As I said, I gravitated before, and I didn't even get the personality of the album. And I had the Phil Spector version until recently. And now it's like, you caught everyone's personality without even seeing the documentary. Like, you can hear, yeah. you hear the falsetto joking around. Like, that's how, yeah. that's how, we, that's how we do sound checks and stuff for yeah. years. Like, yeah. we, we've always messed around with our own songs. Like, you play them so often, you get bored. So you're, like, fucking doing all that. And, like, yeah. you hear Lennon messing around. You hear, you hear Paul. The lyrics themselves are, like, they're so tongue-in-cheek. And I, I think it went over everybody's head at the time when it was released as a regular record. But, like, now you listen back to those lyrics 
you're like, oh, he, yeah, he's talking about some shit right there. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I, I have to say, I'm, I'm fascinated by the effect that it's had, the film has had on so many people. Yes. Um, it, I, I mean, I knew it would be successful just because Peter's name was attached to it, never mind about the Beatles. Um, but I had no idea. That's I don't a think good combo, though. That's a good tag team, right? Right, Charlie? That's a good tag team on yes. the ring. Yes, yes. Excellent tag team. <laughs> Well, for you, Charlie, how was it when you watched that back? I mean, that's seeing your father a way you've never seen him in a lot of respects. I mean, it was before it was long before you came onto this planet. How is it yeah. to, to look back on and see those? Fucking wild. Because, um, <laughs> you know, like I'd, I'd, I'd seen black and white photographs from those sessions, but seeing him that young in color and in film was was amazing. Like... Firstly, how, like, very handsome he was as a young man. Because obviously, oh. like, you know, I've never really seen him. It's a good-looking like, family. It's a, it's a good-looking family overall. It's just... Oh, stop it. <laughs> um, and, um, oh, stop it. Oh, stop it. <laughs> she beat um, you to it, Glenn. And, she always said, oh, stop and, it. <laughs> um, and, and also, like, just, like, how, what, how amazing his fashion sense was. And I, I think the first conversation we had after I'd watched the first episode, I rang him up and I was like, you don't ever get to have any say about anything to do with my tattoos ever again because you walked around in 1960 and I'm wearing a dead fucking goat. <laughs> that was very metal. That was, see, and coming from someone who didn't, didn't necessarily get into the metal side that you did, I mean, wearing a dead goat is pretty fucking metal. <laughs> What is that fucking okay. death? What's that band called? Oh, well, it will come to me. There, there's a band that play, and they have like they purposefully have like dead entry, like animal entrails on their on the stage with them when they play. So that it's I can't fucking remember the name of it. I don't know who it is. But anyway, I love it already. Yes, it's yeah, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> I, Glenn's I'm shaking so his head. Uh, hey, know, hey we, we, we have to be creative. You guys already did everything in the 60s and 70s. We have to be more creative with different things these days. <laughs> That's it, exactly. We have to keep pushing the boundaries. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, like, I think if you are, I am not the world's biggest Beatles fan. I love, I, you know, I think they, they, obviously, I completely respect and understand the in, enormous impact they have had on, on music in general. Um, and I, uh, they have songs. I have there, there are Beatles songs that I love, but I've never been they, like they've never been a band that I've like purposefully gone like chosen to go to listen to. But I think you know I have a lot of friends who are fanatical about the Beatles, and I think the opportunity like you guys were just saying like you know to you Johnny like the, the messing around the studio, messing around the soundtrack or whatever that's so normal to you guys, and it's just something you do every day when you're on the road or whatever. But if you're a fan and you've never seen that, like that's actually really compelling viewing and really exciting to see because it's a side of the band that you don't ever get to see. You only get to see what they want to present to you when they do a show or an interview or whatever. So I think that kind of fly on the wall thing, for, like if you're a big fanatical person about a band, that sort of stuff really, like it is really engaging. Um, I personally thought that it was kind of long, but, if again, if you're a big Beatles fan and you're, you know, like fanatical about that record, that it probably isn't. I know lots of people that thought it was not long enough or whatever. But the concert on the roof and like getting to see that and hear it, and it's you know, because everybody, especially when you live in London and you grow up in London, like you know, you you, it's legendary. Like the Savile Row, like playing on the roof in Savile Row, like that would just never happen now. I so gotta, I got to go check out that spot. To your point, I've been to London a lot of times, and I've never gone and driven around that that area. Like I, I don't. Again, I haven't been to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I haven't driven around the area. I've, I've never done anything iconic. Go around, Luke, <laughs> Charlie, go around, Are you? Do you, what, do you? Do you come to England on tour? Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we've been many times. Are you coming in the near future? Probably in 2023. Yes. Well, we will most likely. Yeah, we just we just gave that to you, fans. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll probably be out there uh, in, in 2023. A little exclusive okay. there. Johnny, Johnny's band headline download multiple times when I worked on Download Festival. Yeah. Um, and I worked on several arena tours with their band when I was at the Live Nation. So, they, yeah. They play, right. they play the UK. No, I'm they just thinking, it, I love, it, I love might, it might be like. nice to come and see you when you play. I don't know. But I'm I telling you right now, you get the, you, you, you retreated like royalty uh, at, at uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 
I'm going to have any kind of scotch you want ready to go. I'm ro- ro- rolling out the red car. But you come, you come check one of my concerts out, Glenn. I'll be over the moon. I, I, I'll okay. put it right I'll there. be there. I should be wearing, you'll know, you'll know it's me. I should be wearing a full diver's outfit. With a <laughs> <laughs> no, I want, I, want, I, want, I want a new carcass. I want to see a new carcass jacket. <laughs> <laughs> a, new, a, a new dead goat. <laughs> um, actually, did it, did it like, for the, for the, for the, when you toured the stage, didn't you have a massive astronaut? Yes, we did. Like, yeah, a, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, a big so, blow-up uh, astronaut for our... Uh, yeah, that that was when the when the cube went out over the front of the stage and everything. Yeah, yeah, you remember all that, Charlie. Yeah, yeah. So, Dad, you should dress as an astronaut, not a diver. <laughs> yeah, there you go. No, no, I'm definitely into divers. I'm not... You're going okay, down. Sorry. You know, I agree with you. There's enough we don't know about on our own planet. Why are we already getting out there? Right. Well, speaking of being a fly on the wall, I want to thank you guys both for letting me be a fly on the wall with your guys' conversations and being a part of this little this little Father's oh, Day it's special. It's, I hope Thanks you guys enjoyed it us. half as much as yeah, I did because I know you had a good time because I'm, I'm rolling today. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy that we were able to do this and that you guys were able to come back for round two of it. And uh, I think we got some really great stuff here, so I appreciate you both. Really cool. Thank you. Thank you. I had a lovely time. It was really good fun. And I hope we get to meet soon, Johnny. Absolutely. Really cool. I will, I will, All right. Well, I'm so happy that you would like to do that because I'd love to. Hey, maybe All even, right. a, ra- maybe even yeah. a round of golf. Let's see. Hey. Yeah, I was going to say you guys should, you you guys should yeah. play golf. Absolutely. The boys, yeah. let me tell you, the rest of the boys in the band would absolutely love that too. So I guess Okay, we'll that. do it. We'll organize it. I'll organize it at my golf club down here in West Sussex next time you're in England, for sure. Absolutely. Well, we'll stay in touch. Right. I appreciate it. Happy Father's right, Day, mate. everybody. We'll see y'all. And to you. Day, and to you. God bless. ta Wow. What an episode of Drinks with Johnny. Being able to just see the dynamic between uh, father and daughter on this week of Father's Day. To all you fathers out there, happy Father's Day. Realize what is really important is being able to show and enjoy and share those moments with your kids because you don't get them back. So uh, happy Father's Day to all of you, new, old, young, whatever fathers out there. And until next time, as always, cheers. Cheers.